a myth has been created that every death at sea is the responsibility of these evil people smugglers who overload boats. We tried to give it to the Indonesians, but they, they said, we don't have the resources, will you please handle it? We said, no, we won't. And as a result of that decision, 150 to 200 people died. And the government has been forced to steadily step backwards from lie after lie, evasion after evasion, from we knew nothing about this boat, to yes, we knew exactly where it sank, uh, we've got coordinates, um, no, we didn't, we didn't go. And then, finally, we launched our rescue response, by which time 90 people had drowned. Where does the responsibility lie? It lies, quite simply, with a tardy or inefficient or irresponsible response to a distress call or to knowledge of distress or to the expectation of distress or to the high risk of distress by our Border Protection Service. The system has convinced itself that people smugglers are the cause of everything. One of the things my book tries to do is to throw the cold light of fact on some of these myths. It's a fact that 97% of asylum seekers trying to reach Australia by unauthorised boat from Indonesia have got here safely. Now, who, who, who sent those boats? People smugglers. So if people smugglers send boats that get here 97% of the people safely, what is the logical conclusion one draws from that? Not that people smugglers are bloodthirsty monsters who send out boats and sink them as a matter of course. But it turns the question then to a rather different kind of question, doesn't it? If 97% of, of boat people get here safely, why do the other 3% not? And unfortunately, the, the results of my research, and it's very meticulous research, I can tell you now that on, on the basis of my study, where does the responsibility lie? It lies, quite simply, with a tardy or inefficient or irresponsible response to a distress call or to knowledge of distress or to the expectation of distress or to the high risk of distress by our Border Protection Service and by our Maritime Safety Authority, which acts as a, pretty much as an adjunct to our Border Protection Service. Let me try to explain them by going through each of these five incidents very quickly. The first two were the two lost boats, boats that got lost in 2009 and 2010. These were both exposed by the fact of asylum seeker families in Australia complaining to the authorities, we expected our relative to be on this boat, it hasn't arrived, what has happened please? Uh, we got phone calls from our relatives on this boat. We got phone calls that they were leaving. We got phone calls that they're in distress. What is happening please? The authorities played dead on both of these occasions. On the first boat, the 2009 boat, the government has been forced to steadily step backwards from lie after lie, evasion after evasion, from we knew nothing about this boat, to yes, we knew exactly where it sank, uh, we've got coordinates, um, no, we didn't, we didn't go, we asked the Indonesians to go, they got there too late, it took three and a half hours to get the information from the Australian Federal Police to the Australian Maritime Safety Authority, then there was another three and a half hours to get the Indonesian rescue boats out to sea. In other words, shambles, shambles, shambles all the way. We knew all the way, and we didn't really perform an efficient and professional and prompt rescue response. Number three, the sinking at Christmas Island, the, the terrible tragedy at Christmas Island. There we have a case of bad weather, radar down, surveillance aircraft down, one efficient Navy vessel which could have been at sea in that weather to the north of the island across the approach routes, uh, making sure that there was nothing coming. What happens? The day before the tragedy, a boat arrives unexpectedly. It nearly crashes. It was supposed to have been 20 miles further out to sea. Instead, it was 300 metres off the cliffs. Uh, it's taken into safe custody by HMAS Piri. They go around to the back of the island where it's more sheltered. The 11 or so passengers are very slowly and laboriously offloaded. Then, very slowly and laboriously, decisions are made as to what to do with the boat. By this time, it's dark. Uh, the decision's taken that it can't be taken out to sea because it's too late to be sunk, so it has to be guarded to stop it becoming a pollution hazard on Christmas Island. 
That means that the boarding party, the naval boarding party, goes on board the empty hulk, keeps motoring it up and down the bay. Therefore, HMAS Piri has to stay there to monitor the safety of the crew on board the hulk. All of this while there's dreadful weather up north, no visibility, and a very strong possibility of another boat coming in because my analysis suggests that they got the data on the two boats merged. Uh, so the, the boat that came in Civ 220 and did arrive safely and the boat that came in Civ 221 and did not, the intelligence data they had somehow merged those two boats. But they haven't admitted that. Anyway, the point I'm making here is that at no, at no point in this process did anyone say there might be another boat coming, there are human lives at risk if there is another boat coming, we'd better get HMAS Piri back onto station. HMAS Piri stayed off station for 15 hours. The next one, the Barocca. Now what we know about the Barocca is really stunning now because initially Jason Clare, the minister, was telling us last December that uh, all we know about this boat we got to learn from the Indonesian authorities. But he inadvertently admitted that, oh yes, we got a distress signal from that boat, but it was so far away from us and so close to Indonesia, he gave it to the Indonesians. And, but they, they said, we don't have the resources, will you please handle it? We said, no, we won't. And as a result of that decision, 150 to 200 people died. They are shameful because they are all unnecessary deaths. We have huge resources up there for border protection to detect and intercept the national security threat represented by a few people on a fishing boat. And you see, once you've defined asylum seekers as a national security threat, they cease to be human beings. They become just blips on a radar screen. And you can then say things like, as the head of Border Protection Command said, and as his supervisor, the senior officer in the Department of Customs and Border Protection said, we do not regard border protection as a safety of life at sea activity. We are not responsible for safety of life at sea. If people put themselves in harm's way, that's their problem. Now, of course, that's nonsense, because <laughs> safety of life at sea does not judge whether people are to blame for putting themselves in harm's way, nor is any other kind of rescue response for that matter. All rescues proceed on the basis that if people are in trouble and call for help, you try to help them, whether they be people who've fallen off a cliff in the Blue Mountains or, or people who've decided to sail around the world uh, to their wisdom in a, in, a, in a 20 foot boat and get into trouble halfway across the Indian Ocean, or people on an asylum seeker boat. The rescue at sea response is indivisible, and it, it is not an occasion for making hair-splitting judgments as to who are good people to be rescued and who are bad people not to be rescued. We duck shove, and we duck and we weave, and we, we blame the people smugglers, and we blame the Indonesian search and rescue authority by inference, we blame Indonesian incompetence, we do everything possible but say we got this wrong and hundreds of people died. My, my father was a naval officer and I, I feel quite strongly on this, also my mother was a Jewish refugee so I feel <coughs> quite strongly on it from that point of view too. But I think it's really quite wrong for um, the Navy people and the Border Protection Command people to be put in situations where they know that their, their normal professional protocols are being undermined from behind by politicians, by bureaucrats, by people who are giving them subliminal messages, hey, look, you don't really have to try too hard to rescue them, they're just asylum seekers. And the constant refrain from the opposition and from the news limited press that these distress calls are not genuine these people are just trying to get a taxi ride. These people are looking for a water taxi. These dreadful things continue to be said as hundreds of people have continued to die. I, I can't believe that the, the nature of the debate between the major political parties, and I, I, I give the Greens and the Socialist Alliance and the, and the, and the left parties an honourable exception from this, but between the major polit political parties the debate is conducted on the basis of such false premises. We have to tell our Border Protection Command, your job is to do everything possible to save people if they need saving, full stop. Thank you. I do value enormously the work that you're all doing to support the human rights of asylum seekers in Australia.